In problem four, we're going to do a goodness of fit test for a normal distribution. The data down here are from a sample of 37 Subway sandwiches. So the first sandwich in the sample was 11.87 inches long. The last sandwich is only 11.81 inches long. So to do this, first we're going to copy this data into Excel. After we copy it into Excel, we've got to put it in a column. So maybe the best way to do that is to first copy it again, and then down here, transpose it. And then I can just drag these into one long column. And then I'm going to sort it from lowest to highest. Maybe add a decimal place. So how many do we have? Do we have all 37? Yep, we have 37. So I'm going to copy this into a template I download from my website. The template is under um, Chapter 12, Case 4. So you click on that, you download that. I'm going to paste my observations right here. I'll just double check to see if we have th all 37 here. And we do. We can tell by the little white box on the bottom right hand corner of the blue shaded area. In cell E7, I type the command count A. And when I do that, I get a count of 37. In the next, I type equal average, and the average is 12. But to five decimal places, it's 12.01730. To five decimal places, the sample standard deviation is 0.12952. I'm going to copy the sample mean into Cengage now. And the sample standard deviation. Both of these are statistics. They're point estimates of the true population mean and the point estimate of the true population standard deviation. The sample size again was 37. The test statistic in a goodness of fit test requires the expected frequency to be at least 5. We'll call this value the minimum required expected frequency and denote it E subscript min. If the expected frequencies are greater than or equal to 5, the test statistic for this test will follow a chi-square distribution with k minus 3 degrees of freedom. In part D, we want to determine the number of areas the normal distribution is to be split into, which we're going to denote as k. The first step is to divide the sample size, 37, by 5. I'm going to copy that into Excel and paste it right here. I get 7.4. According to this note, you want to round this number down to the nearest even integer. So the nearest even integer below 7.4 is 6. So we're going to type 6 into here. So we're going to split the standard normal distribution into six parts. Here we have one, two, three, four, five, six. So diagram A below shows how the standard normal distribution is split for this test. The six areas under the standard normal distribution correspond to six intervals, where the first interval which is from negative infinity to whatever negative z1 equals, has a lower limit equal to negative infinity. The intervals are equal in the sense that the probability of being in each interval, those probabilities are all the same. They don't have equal width. They have equal probability. 
And since the area under any distribution sums to 1, and there are 6 intervals in this case, and 1 divided by 6 plus 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 1 divided by 6 equals 1, the probability of being in each interval is 1 divided by 6. I'm going to copy this into Excel to compute the probability, which is 0.1667. Next, we want to compute the expected frequency for each interval. According to the yellow comment that shows up when you put the cursor in the cell, the expected frequency, E, is equal to the sample size times the probability of being in each interval. So 37 times 0.166. I'm going to copy this into Syngage. Now, I want four decimal places, so there's 6.1667. Next, I got to use the standard normal table to find the z values that correspond to these values. Because I split the standard normal distribution into six parts, I only have to find two z values. So if I find this value, I know that value. If I find this value, I know that value. To find negative z1, I have to look up the z value in the standard normal table that corresponds to a lower probability value of 0.1667. So in the standard normal table, I got to find 0.1667 or the number closest to it. Here I got 0.1660, here I got 0.1635, and here I got 1.685. So this is the number closest to 0.1667, and it falls in row negative 0.9 and column 07. So negative Z1 is negative 0.97. With negative z1 equal to negative 0.97, positive z1 is equal to positive 0.97. Next we gotta find negative z2. Negative z2 is the z value that corresponds to a left tail probability equal to 0.1667 plus 0.1667. 0.1667 plus 0.1667 is 0.3333. So now we gotta go to the Z table and find 0.3333, or the number closest to 0.3333. Here we have 0.3336, here we have 0.3372, and here we have 0.3300. Because 0.336 is closest to 0.333, the Z value is negative 0.43. Since negative z2 is negative 0.43, positive z2 is 0.43. The upper limit of interval 1 is negative 0.97. The probability of being less than negative 0.97 is 0.1667. For interval 2, the upper limit is negative 0.43. The probability of being less than negative 0.43 is 0.3333. The upper limit of the third interval is 0. The probability of being less than that is 0.5. The upper limit of the fourth interval is 0.43. The probability of being less than that is 0.667. The upper limit of the fifth interval is 0.97. The probability of being less than that is 0.8333. The upper limit of the last interval is infinity, and the probability of being less than that is 1. Next, we're going to use these z values and the sample statistics, x bar and s, to create intervals for the test. The first thing we want to do is take the sample mean, 12.01730, Add to it the z value times the standard deviation. 
and we get 11.8917. Since E8 is the mean, I'm going to hit F4 here. That'll lock the cell at E8. E9 is the sample standard deviation. If I hit the F4 key on the keyboard again, I'll lock the cell on the standard deviation from the sample, cell E9. So a cool thing about Excel is if I pull this down, I get the upper limits of my intervals. So we'll double click on this, and you see that we're multiplying the second Z value by the standard deviation and adding that to the sample mean and so on and so forth until the fifth upper limit. In the cell containing the fifth upper limit, the fifth Z value is multiplied by the sample standard deviation and that product is added to the sample mean. The lower limit of the second interval is the upper limit of the first interval. The lower limit of the third interval is the upper limit of the second interval. And so on and so forth. Recall that we've already computed the expected frequencies. So the expected frequency of being in each interval is just 6.1667. The observed frequencies are going to be found by using the equal frequency command. When you use a frequency command, you have to highlight all of the cells. In this case, we highlight cells G36 to G41. And we highlight those cells because that's where we want the frequencies to appear. The data array is over here. It's the 37 observations. The bins array is the upper limits of the intervals. Now this is an array function so we're going to hit control shift enter. And so the observed frequencies are 6, 8, 6, 5, 7, 5. To double check that we did it right we're going to sum the values in this column, and we get 37. The expected frequencies should add up to 37 as well, and they do. So what does this 6 mean? It means there are 6 of these observations over here that are less than 11.892. What does this 8 mean here? It means that there are 8 of these observations over here that are between 11.892 11.962, etc. The 5 here indicates that there are 5 of these observations that are between 12.143 and infinity. So to calculate the chi-square stat, the first thing you have to do is take the square deviation from expected. And the way that is done is by typing equal parentheses G36 minus H36 and then close parenthesis squared. Once I have one of them done, I have all of them done. The final step is to take what we just did and divide by the expected frequency. I can do them all really quickly by just grabbing the bottom right hand corner of this cell and pulling it down. The sum of this column is the chi-score stat and it's 1.108. Okay, I've copied the upper limits and lower limits into this table. Because the test only has six intervals, I'm going to copy infinity into the upper limit of interval six and then NA and all the remaining answer blanks. The next thing I want to do is copy 
the observed frequencies into this table, and I've already done that. Because there's only six intervals to this test, I need to copy an A into the remaining answer blanks in the table. Remember the test statistic was 1.108. The degrees of freedom for this test are k minus 3. We have k equal to 6 intervals, so 6 minus 3 is 3. Recall that all tests in chapter 12 are upper tail. So we divide the alpha level, 5% here, by 1. So we're going to be in column 0.05 and row 3 of the chi-square table. So in column 0.05 and row 3, we have a critical value equal to 7.815. To conclude in part I, we compare the test statistic to the critical value. If the test statistic is less than the critical value, the difference in the observed frequency and the hypothesized frequency is very small. Thus, the test suggests the data are normally distributed. We're going to check our work, and we get everything correct.